I don't think the sound was recorded either. <laughs> That's just great. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, <clears throat> we'll continue. Uh, second part of chapter two. And uh, we are <clears throat> on the side of uh, talking about knowledge management systems. Um, so we, all, we talked about enterprise systems and now these are knowledge management systems. Um, knowledge management systems are ways that organizations create, acquire, capture, store, transfer, share, and use knowledge. And that um, if you see on this uh, table 2-3, which is on page 45, the book, uh, we have um, the headers of uh, this are knowledge creation, knowledge storage retrieval, knowledge transfer, and knowledge application. And these align with this create. Uh, this is storage retrieval is acquire, capture, store. Transfer and share is transfer, and then use this application. And then um, you have knowledge management systems about customers. They can be about markets. It can be about products, services, and uh, processes, business processes, both internal and external business processes. Um, so you see that in the table it says it's uh, they are also for um, supporting information technologies. There's different types of data mining, electronic bulletin boards, and these so <coughs> discussion forums and expert systems. These support different stages of the processes. And then enabling, it, IT enables a uh, combination of knowledge for just-in-time learning, supports individual organizations' memory, uh, and supports in networks, and knowledge can be applied to m many locations and applications. Um, we have um, Feng, he says that the advantage of knowledge management systems are so that you can share best practices. Uh, it allows you to um, develop and share knowledge networks or knowledge directories, so directories of people, uh, directories of resources, and uh, knowledge management systems um, deal with structured information and data. So they don't deal with unstructured data, but it needs to be structured in some way. And there's two types of knowledge uh, there's explicit knowledge, which is usually structured and is in can be found in databases, for example. An example of this is this is discussed on page forty seven. And um, I talk about the Siemens share network in the case study. And then there's the tacit knowledge, which is contained within individuals. And the goal of an organization is to be able to manage, or structuralize their information so that they can reuse it and be able to um, bring it into the um, resources of the organization so the organization can then use it in future situations and so forth. So uh, individuals have uh, knowledge themselves, expertise, and they usually the organizations try to capture the individual knowledge and make it explicit so that the organization can benefit from this and it can be shared with other individuals within the organization. So there's different types of <coughs> models for how tacit information becomes explicit knowledge. And then um, um, on the page uh, 48, uh, there's table 2-4. And this shows that there's two kinds of models, uh, two views of the knowledge management process. There's the cognitive model and there's the community model. 
and the cognitive model is intended that um, uh, it's associated for explicit knowledge, for, whereas the community model is working with uh, tacit knowledge. So if you, if you have certain kinds of knowledge, if you have explicit knowledge, you need to work with the cognitive model, whereas if you have tacit knowledge, you need to work with the community model, because this is how you, <coughs> the community model is about sharing information and knowledge among individuals, whereas the cognitive model uh, allows you to share uh, explicit knowledge. So in the cognitive model, the knowledge is equated with objectivity, defined concepts and facts. Knowledge is transferred through text information systems and uh, they have a critical role. Uh, gains in knowledge management include recycling of knowledge and standardization of systems. Uh, the primary function of knowledge management is to codify and capture knowledge. Um, the dominant metaphor is human memory and the critical success factor is technology. So that's <coughs> for the cognitive model. In the community model, uh, the knowledge is socially constructed and based on ex experience. So again, this is the experience of the individuals. Knowledge is transferred through participation in social networks, including occupational groups and teams. Uh, it's gained from knowledge management, including greater awareness of internal and external sources of knowledge. And the primary function of the knowledge management is to encourage knowledge sharing between groups and individuals. The dominant metaphor is the community, and the critical success factor is trust. So whereas the cognitive model is, is based on um, technology, the uh, community model is based on trust. Okay, um, I just uh, wanted to uh, read a quote about the organization and management issues of knowledge management systems. It says that, um, a uh, quote by Gupta and Gumbindara Run, I can't say his name very well. Uh, it says that effective knowledge management depends not merely on information technology platforms, but on the social ecology of an organization, uh, the social system in which people operate, made up of culture, structure, information systems, reward systems, processes, people, and leadership. Uh, so what they're saying in this is that uh, knowledge management systems also depend on culture and that one knowledge management system may not function well within another organizational culture. So you need to be able to modify the systems uh, to meet the, the cultural needs of the organization. The next uh, type of system we should talk about is the customer resource management system. And these are systems are for managing customers and um, processes with customers. And the whole point of these systems are to develop long-term business with customers. promises of customer manage, uh, resource management systems are that uh, they hope to be able to enable you to gather customers quick, swiftly, to be able to identify the value of customers, to be able to increase loyalty and retain customers, and to reduce the cost to serve customers and, ease, and make it easier to uh, get uh, new customers. So this is a lot of promises, so you want to gain customers swiftly. Identify value. Increase loyalty.
reduce, reduce the cost to serve the customer. The, and make it easier to get to new uh, customers. And then um, uh, it helps to, they sh the, these systems should help you to find out who is the most loyal, who is the most profitable. and what they want and buy. Um, so on figure two, four, there's uh, questions with respect to customer selection, acquisition, retention, and extension. Uh, these are the four main areas that you want to be able to um, <coughs> do. You want to be able to select customers, acquire customers, retain them, and extend them. So these are the four things, uh, four areas that you're trying to achieve is acquisition, retention, extension, and selection. It's not necessarily in that order. So, so they're asking, um, how can we acquire customers in a most effective and efficient way? What criteria determines who will be our most profitable customers? How can we keep the customers as long as possible? And how can we increase the loyalty of the customers? Um, I, this is, uh, reminds me of an article I read where there was somebody that was dressed up in some sort of a, um, I don't know if it was like a, a dinosaur costume or something, something very uh, ridiculous. Or maybe, no, maybe they were dressed up like a fruit or something. And then they were out in front of a grocery store. And then they were just like greeting customers and chatting with people. And they were maybe dressed up like a big apple or something. And uh, they asked, why do you do this? And it's because... Um, they want to be able to uh, retain the customers. They want to be able to work with the customers because everybody that spends money at this uh, store spends maybe $100 a week at the store. And if they can get the customers to want to come back there and be a loyal customer, that the lifetime value of the customer uh, has uh, meaning for the company. So they. They figure out if they come 52 weeks a year, $100 a week, and then they come for many years, that this customer is worth so much money uh, to the company. <coughs> and this, um, this goes along with this uh, model that's, that shows that uh, CRM system should help you to find out uh, what is the value of a customer. Um, so there's three dimensions. There's the monetary value, there's the frequency, and there's the recency. And the study found that um, in terms of monetary scale, if the customer uh, spends a lot, they're more likely to return and buy again. And that if they have uh, shopped frequently, or, uh, frequently, they're more likely to buy again. And then if they have recently purchased something, they're more likely to buy again. So all of these things lead to that the people at the, at the upper right-hand corner of the cube, um, <coughs> that uh, uh, these people are the most likely to purchase again. And then from this type of model, this uh, RFM model, <coughs> you can calculate the lifetime value of the customer. Um, this is an RFM. So this is a um, recent frequent and monetary model. 
So that's that figure is too fine. This is something that is uh, of interest to company and the reasons they want to be able to um, be able to calculate how much uh, the, the customers are worth. And <coughs> but many CRM systems fail, like in the uh, example that we read by the Dutch company. Uh, and why did they fail is because um, the uh, CRM system has to work with other systems like order fulfillment systems. that you deal with things like change management. And this requires that the organization deals with training and, um, and this has to do with cultural issues. Uh, that the, um, the culture must be adapting You need to deal with multi-channel communication. And uh, that means like you might have to deal with customers by phone, and by email, and some other means. So uh, if you can think of a, a CRM system, for example, the airlines, they have to deal with customers. And what kinds of ways do they use to interact with customers? If you <coughs> order a ticket, you want to change your ticket, you have some kind of problem with it, how does the, like say SAS, how do they interact with customers? What are some of the communication channels used? Phone, okay. Email. Email. Um, they also have. Go to the yes, in person. Um, and then there's also this. There's a chat box. There's a website with their with information like for frequently asked questions. So if if I have to change a a flight, and it's something I've already purchased. Maybe I have logged in and I have used my account, so they have a record of this. And then first I check the website, and that's usually not very helpful. You can't change anything. Uh, then you might go to the online chat, because instead of waiting on the phone for an hour, you might be able to resolve the issue by the chat. But if it's something to do with um, um, like changing of uh, money or something, you have to add more money or something, then they can't do it and they tell you to call up. So there's kind of, um, there's, their system is meant to also funnel you to different uh, places depending on what your problem is and also to give you some sort of response that is satisfactory to the customer but not taking so much time either. So <coughs> all companies usually need to have some sort of a customer management system in place 
and um, uh, a lot of people, their front line for their system is the, is the telephone system. And you get a lot of these uh, systems where you ask, please select uh, number one if you have this kind of problem, number two if you have another kind of problem, and so forth. And uh, sometimes, like with some systems they've done that you get a standardized response. And other systems that people kind of decide that this is wasting my time and they just want to get to the end of the question so they can get to a person. So um, you have to think about how you combine these systems. If you have some help that's online, like a website, you have to think about how you combine this with your other systems so that you're actually helping the customer and not annoying them. And then um, you have to coordinate Uh, departments on the, on the system. So in other words, you might have sales in engineering. And the feedback that you get from the system has to influence all of the departments. So if you get some feedback uh, through the sales system that says, this was not designed correctly, that has to also be integrated with um, the engineering department, so they have to be able to know um, what the results of the system are. Okay, okay um, so yeah, before we talk about the ERP, and then, so that was one, and to knowledge management systems and three is CRM. And then uh, number four, we should talk about the interorganizational systems. Um, interorganizational systems are designed to integrate, uh, go beyond the enterprise. So you have connections between the organization and their enterprise resource planning system, uh, their business intelligence, customer services, business processes, and others, partners in the supply chain. So you have suppliers, distributors, customers, you can have partners, and other types of organizations. So the purpose of these are to create new efficiencies. These are you know, quite often called e-commerce or e-business systems. Uh, e-commerce is noted mostly with the buying and selling of products, whereas uh, e-business systems are for all types of processes between uh, partners and supply chains. And so. One of the goals of these are to make better, uh, improve the value. In supply chains, for example. And um, so these types of systems, you can have systems. And they should, the IS should support Uh, the distribution processes. But the book uses distribution, but it's not just distribution, but it's really order fulfillment. of the distribution and it should, should support these uh, in the different types of transactions like 
B to C, business to customer, and B to B, business to business. And these systems, these systems link the partners in the supply chain. And that the goal is to better meet customer needs. So the whole goal of these uh, interorganizational systems are to um, improve the value to the customer, the business value, and they can usually um, develop over phases from online presence to interaction, transaction integration, and transformation. <coughs> the last being the transformation of the supply chain. Um, the, one of the, the last sections talks about um, IS in the supply chain and what does that mean. Um, um, there's um, uh, when you introduce information technology into the supply chain, there's a possibility that some of the players in the supply chain, like the retailers, um, are disintermediated and they don't give the example in the book but one example is um, uh, the travel agency the physical local travel agents where before you would go to them and you would plan uh, your vacation for example uh, today they don't exist anymore because so you go directly from ordering things from for example the airlines or the hotels which are the wholesalers and it goes directly to the consumer can make those orders directly um, <coughs> however there is some sort of a need sometimes for uh, joining information together so maybe you need to plan your whole vacation you need to combine your uh, flights with your hotels and other activities in the area and so there's there can be a, a reintroduction of an info mediary in the supply chain and this would be, um, for example, <coughs> the meta search engines and the, and the deal creators, like for example, uh, the company Dohop allows you to combine different types of, look for your, the best deal on flights and be able to um, introduce uh, ordering hotels and ordering cars and things like that. And these are an, an info mediary, which is reintroduced into the uh, supply chain. So uh, in several industries there has been a replacement of a physical retailer with an information uh, uh, intermediary. And then the intermediary has to provide some sort of a new surface, a new ser service, uh, so it allows, for example, uh, you to be able to search for suppliers or to be able to evaluate products for example. And that's like the role of DOHOP in the um, in the travel industry. They act as an inter info intermediary and they allow you to be able to search for the different sources and be able to evaluate which is the best for you. Okay. The purpose of um, the disintermediation has been to try to reduce transaction costs and also to increase the reach of the company. Uh, and this is not um, reintroduced with the re-intermediaries. Um, the book also mentions uh, mobile commerce in the interorganizational systems. And um, they mention the use of mobile phones in, in like uh, checking on your flight status 
as part of the interorganizational system. I think mobile technologies are an extension of many different systems as a different type of access point. And they're not just, uh, of course, associated with uh, interorganizational systems, but they are part of most uh, systems. Uh, interorganizational systems should work with the order fulfillment process. And um, companies that just do uh, virtual businesses only, like uh, e-business, might have a problem with their order fulfillment process. If you're just selling something online, like the Amazon has developed a whole uh, logistical system for delivering goods and services uh, to the end user. But when a company first goes online, uh, they might, if they already have a physical uh, order fulfillment system supply chain in place, this is usually of benefit to them. But uh, if the companies that miss parts of the supply chain uh, might have to go into partnership with other companies in order to uh, fulfill those needs. So the last time we talked about also um, uh, UPS as being uh, one company that helps uh, complete uh, companies' supply chains. So instead of having to uh, do that uh, delivery on order fulfillment process, uh, UPS does that part of the supply chain for them. And then the manufacturer can focus on their product. So UPS working with Nike, for example, um, would um, be able to deliver the products to the customer. We're working with Toshiba, be able to pick up computers and be able to have them repaired and returned to the customer. And they're fulfilling part of the, of the order fulfillment process. So virtual organizations often have to uh, work in partnerships with other organizations uh, to fulfill uh, this need. Um, McCaff is um, uh, this is uh, McCaff's law is, is that the value of a network increases with the square of the number of users connected to the network. And what this means is that as a network gets bigger, it has greater value. And we also talked about this another time. Uh, there's a positive network effect. So if um, if your network is more inclusive of everybody, then uh, there's mm, greater access. You can reach more people. You can share with more people. And it also that the members on this network are also maybe contributing to the content of the network, contributing to the value of the network. So bigger in information networks is usually better. Uh, companies like Google build platforms that help end users to create content. And uh, one of the themes talked about in the end of this chapter is, is co-creation design, that user-generated content also adds value to the network. And that uh, information products, <coughs> um, like um, when they get consumed, they don't uh, reduce, it's not to reduce in value, but it increases value. So um, value is created with more users and more information uh, and more content creation. And um, next time we will have a, a lecture about what is co-creation design and who's involved in co-creation design. So um, the final um, transparency on this slide set is about uh, the new delivery systems where uh, as before, the traditional pattern was the producer would deliver something and the customer would pay for it. Uh, in the new system, the, um, the producer creates a platform and it asks what the customer wants and then the customers also contribute to the creation on that platform. And they use uh, uh, examples of Wikipedia, uh, for example, where people create the content and then it becomes of greater value to 
everyone is part of uh, the system. Um, they also mention on page uh, yeah this was this is basically the end page 63 uh, there's a problem maybe with uh, digital rights management so uh, what is the what is the problems when you have people creating content and also what kinds of um, um, how do you give people credit for what they're making and how do you make sure that people pay uh, for those that have individual contributions? Uh, so that's, that's something that needs to be uh, worked out. And they say that the software like digital rights management software uh, may not be the only answer to this, that there needs to also be some other kinds of um, um, kind of uh, system uh, for uh, in place to encourage people to pay for products. If we could think of an example like uh, what is the business model for Spotify? Um, do you know who Spotify is? Yeah. Okay, so like what do they do? They have, uh, you, can, you can stream music to your devices like your phone and uh, do you pay for the music? But if you, yeah, if you yes, yes, but do, can you also get it for free? Yeah, yeah, and then you also have um, uh, maybe advertisements as yeah. well, and there's limited to what you can get, okay. and then you can't get it offline and things like that. So there's a lot of restrictions. So because of the level of service. People are willing to pay for that, and um, even though you could might be able to find music elsewhere, uh, people are less likely to go around that system than if you put some sort of a uh, restriction on the on the media file itself. So, yeah. So there has to be a business model that works with digital rights and that has to uh, encourage people to comply with the with the um, with the digital rights of the of the artists who are creating uh, the 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 content so for systems that are open and uh, cooperative um, there needs to be some sort of uh, system in place and I think uh, there's things like um, I think they're called uh, vines. I'm not sure, but there's like s short kinds of videos and stuff, and people create those. And then uh, you can also have companies that may adopt those to go with their music, for example. And there's like I think there was something on this uh, BBC Click that talked about a company that. Um, creates videos and the companies that other people that create music can hire can purchase the videos from somebody else that's created the video and they can apply it to their music so this is where different people are creating content and getting uh, getting paid for it so there needs to be some kind of uh, platform in place to allow people to exchange that um, Okay. Um, why don't we take a break now and then after this we'll talk about the next set of notes after the break.
the schedule is listing as no scheduled meeting. Yes. Uh, does that simply mean that there is no... Um, it means there's no lecture. Is there something else the students are supposed to do in the time, or is it... Uh, no, you can... Uh, the, the idea is that I try to make up those periods by having the long days. Okay. So and okay. then uh, you can work on your exercises. Yeah. Yeah. Then for the first exercise, from um, mm. where you're supposed to read the sentence, the review of um, this uh, literature of two piece and advice on you and w whether you agree with him, think he's right, and so on and so forth. Mm. Is this in the book, or is this a separate uh, review of literature? Yeah, if you look at the... Um, So, um, the blue hyperlink, does that link to... Uh, this is a discussion yeah. about whether he's right or whether he's wrong. Okay. And then the other one, this is the article itself. So those are two you're going to use in the first exercise? Yeah. Kay. But if you want to, like, they make references here to the people that argue with him. If you want to look up their arguments, you're welcome to do that. If you feel it gets not enough. <laughs> how, um, how large are the hand and uh, exercises supposed to be? Just answer the questions. They don't have to be long. Okay. Yeah. Mm. this book has the same year on it as the previous book that we used it seems <coughs> like it's so much more up to date because I think the previous book was like the seventh edition and they hadn't been changing it very much and then this one is like the first of the third edition but it just seems to talk about more of the more recent technologies than the other book so it's then it's it's pretty simple to read it's not a lot of extra Blurbs. <laughs> um, I was wondering, maybe I should just, since we're all here, I should just continue now, and then if we get done early, then you can buy the book afterwards. Is that okay? Because we're not using the book for this next slide set, and I don't think this will take very long to discuss. Mm. This uh, slide set was written by Kai Olson, who created the slide set for previous year's courses. And um, he talks about uh, central IT technologies and the most pioneering technologies. And when I, <laughs> I looked up the word Bane, uh, Brit, and the technologies in, the, in Google Translate, <laughs> and I think that because I thought of it as um, as field changing or something like that, the leading edge. But then I found out the word was pioneering, and I think that that's kind of uh, it's interesting that it has this uh, embedded meaning in it because if you separate the words, it means field uh, edge, and then it's also pioneering. So I think that that's kind of telling of the kind of technology that's included here. He bases this on uh, 
an article that was in IEEE Spectrum. And he points out the 11 uh, pioneering technologists, uh, smart telephone, social networks, IP telephony, um, multi-core GPU, cloud computing, digital photography, drones, and rovers. And he also says that there's high quality sound, LEDs, flexible, um, um, electric, the power, flexible power, creation, or is transfer, transfer. <coughs> and he says that most of these are IT related in some way. Um, uh, one of the, the smartphones have um, been able to integrate a lot of different uh, functions that used to be separate. So it has um, telephone and it has camera ability. You can play music. You can watch things as well. And um, uh, the advantage is that it's um, often easier to do these things from your telephone than from a PC. So quite often now I go to conferences and I don't even take a PC anymore. And that was not very long ago that I felt like I had to. Whereas now, it doesn't matter what terminal you use. Uh, any terminal is good enough. And for just checking email, it's good enough to have your phone with you. And these are all relatively uh, new functions with stronger uh, devices. And also, um, <coughs> you have a lot of people creating third-party applications, which increases the value of the phone and the networks and devices that everyone is creating because the the um, network becomes more important. Like I, I use an application called um, Fiber for communication. It's like, it's like Skype. And the reason I use this is because my other family members are on this and then I don't have to pay for calls to them. So <coughs> uh, this is again an uh, advantage of being part of a network and um, <coughs> there's also the technology itself has uh, developed and now there's a commercial out for chess it's a, a provider and the advertisement says something like your service is only as fast as your subscription so now everybody has these super powerful phones that have port for 4G, for example, but you're not going to get that kind of service if you're not paying for it. So they're trying to get you to pay also for the network as well as, as the service. But anyway, this has been a great um, um, uh, development in many technologies and I guess also used in like customer resource management systems to have these types of interfaces. Um, he points out there, at least the earlier problems with the telephones are that they have little screens, they're easy to lose, there has been battery life issues, and the uh, question about always being on the net. Uh, this can be costly and it depends on what your package is. So <coughs> you need to, um, these, many of these issues are resolving themselves. There's a variety of sizes of screens and with touch screen uh, telephones and devices, you can adjust the size of the text that you're looking at. So if you're not happy to read something that's very tiny, you can make it bigger and then read it. So uh, many of these things are being resolved and also with battery life are extending and also you there's uh, different types of devices that help you to recharge mo from almost anywhere. Okay. Uh, social services, um, <coughs> they help you keep in contact with people and groups that are important to you. So many times uh, social participation within a group no longer depends on physical location. 
and this is important both in social networks and working networks. Uh, so he mentions several of the social networks here, uh, but you also have uh, professional networks like LinkedIn, for example, and uh, this allows you to, um, it's a formal service for being able to identify where people are, and then you can also be in contact with them independently afterwards. So I work with people that are all over the world, not necessarily in Molda, and it's not the, the least bit of a problem uh, because of not the social networks, but um, be because of other types of software that allows you to um, co work collaboratively. But the networks themselves help you to identify uh, people that might be of uh, interest or of help to you. Uh, it talks about Facebook and um, uh, Facebook is uh, grown even beyond what they originally expected. Um, there's other types of uh, communication software, Twitter, Instagram, and um, uh, once you are in contact with people, you also can uh, you use one-to-one -one contact and these systems often support this as well. You have the mail that's in or messaging that's internal to these systems that allow you to continue contact after the you are part of the network. And, um, and this is true that I hadn't used uh, Facebook for a long time uh, because I had felt like I had too many things that I had to check up on and it takes a lot of time. And then uh, finally I needed it for a particular purpose to put up a group on the, on the page. And then um, since then I've been getting contacts from like high school friends. and so, so it's like once you're out there then suddenly you're visible to the entire world. And, uh, and it's amazing that the reach that these systems have. Um, mention also types of group systems. This is like to, to expose yourself, not just to yourself, to a few select people, but to even a general public. And YouTube, Flickr, LinkedIn are ways of uh, getting you in touch with larger groups of, of people. Um, they don't mention so much on the one-to-one -one side, but the applications like uh, WhatsApp or Viber or Skype are good for also one-to-one -one communications.